PJ Washington and Mitch Kupchak speak to the media after PJ finally signed a contract. We'll get to some of those comments today on Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. We It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free. We're available anywhere you get your podcast. That includes YouTube, as always. That's Doug Branson. You can find his work on his Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. You can listen to me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. Sports Radio 92.7 WFNZ. Uh, you can also text Doug on his new subtext because there's lots of subs that Doug is surrounding himself with uh how is the subtext going did you get any subscribers yesterday uh yeah we did get some early adopters yesterday uh, i've got a text queued up ready to go after we get done producing this show had to you know i have a baby i gotta get the baby to school then i had to run back here get the dog out now we're doing a show so the text is coming for the early adopters get on board now i've got some pj thoughts i've got some byron mullins pictures join subtext.com slash locked on hornets um, Mitch Kupchak also has some PJ thoughts, doesn't he? Uh, we got to hear from both of these guys at the press conference yesterday, and we were making the jokes. I was making the jokes. Mitch Kupchak, when he goes to the podium, he's honest. He's a little too honest sometimes. That's just how <laughs> Mitch rolls, man. He's going to let you know what he's thinking. And that's exactly what he did after this long off season of negotiating with PJ Washington, trying to find the right terms for him to either come back to the Charlotte Hornets or maybe agree to a sign and trade or whatever, you know, maybe PJ would have come back to Charlotte on the QO. You know, PJ told you he always wanted to be in Charlotte. Then Mitch gave you his honest thoughts after that. And well, you know, we have the clip for you. I always wanted to stay in Charlotte. Um, it was no doubt about that. Um, I think it was a great that's deal. Not, I think. That's not what your agent and your, your agents were saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first I heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like I said, I definitely wanted to stay here. <laughs> PJ not knowing how to respond to that. And then immediately picking up where he left off in the script, what? understanding what questions were going to be coming his way. Like I said, I'm just, I always wanted to be back in Charlotte. I'm glad Mitch Kupchak was drinking his water and it was almost the David Stern thing. The GIF where he's coughing, he takes the sip of water. He coughs. That's not what your agent said. It's a great Mitch moment at the podium once again. And I don't. I wouldn't put it past Mitch to have had that line queued up because he's been playing the game long enough. He probably has the script memorized. He knows what players say yeah. in these moments. So I wouldn't put it past him to have it queued up, but he was drinking water at the time and he stopped drinking water mm -hmm. to get that line off to essentially, he said to PJ cap, I'm calling cap on that. Whatever you're uh, saying about yeah, wanting to stay in good. Charlotte. I saw the Instagram post where you were saying, can I find a trainer in Dallas? You know, we know the overtures that were being made. Um, what makes that clip even funnier is that one of PJ's representatives was his father, PJ That's Washington right. Sr. And, or Paul Washington Sr. And th he was probably in the front row because they mentioned that his family was there. One would assume that his agent... And father would be there as well. So essentially, you've got Mitch saying that's not what your agent said with the, with one of the agents in the audience. Just an amazing moment. And one that you called when we did the episode yesterday and we said, what do we yeah. want to hear? Uh, you mentioned that this was a possibility that we were going to get honest Mitch. And I love it. And it was funny. Yeah. I mean, this is what he does, man. He's I'm <laughs> sometimes it's bad. And sometimes it's funny. It, I'll this miss is more it. I'll miss it either side. way. There's not a lot about the Mitch Kupchak era that I will miss, but I will miss this. Well, yeah, this is this is on the lighter side. Like I even tweeted it out yesterday. He's a little too honest, but it's still it's fine, right? I mean, even with Mitch saying this, we know that it, he's not saying anything that is uncovering some truth that was covered. It was all this was all going to happen this entire offseason. PJ and his representatives. We're going to try to get the best deal possible, even if it meant waiting for a long time. Mitch Kupchak was going to do the same thing, try to get the best deal 
for the Charlotte Hornets and also, you know, Queen City residents are living this over again with the Brian Burns negotiations with the Carolina Panthers. Just for any Panthers fans out there, you know, now he might hold out. You know, there's there's not really any holding out in the NBA because all the money is guaranteed. But if it wasn't P.J. Washington's negotiations, that would have been a holdout potential scenario if this thing would have gone all the way in. Now, I know he's a free agent. You get the idea. This thing went a real long time. Uh, it did. It was a tough negotiation. Uh, I think in the in the next segment, Mitch, we should talk about Mitch's uncovering of some of how that negotiation went, because uh, I think that's very interesting. Um, but on the qualifying offer piece, they they did mention that as well. Someone asked, like with with Miles Bridges taking the qualifying offer, how important was it for Mitch in that front office to get a deal done with another one of their young players? And Mitch was honest about that too, and said, "Look, that's." You know, to have two players that sign qualifying offers, that's not uh, something that happens a lot for organizations. And, and I would say that the it would be an embarrassment for this organization if that had happened because they have put so much of their eggs into the sign-your-own-players basket. And on the on the Charlotte front, you know, him him wanting to be in Charlotte or not wanting to be in Charlotte, again, I don't really care about that. I think it's a sneak advantage sometimes – For players who like a big city, small town feel that Charlotte gives, it gives you a little bit of anonymity. I think that can be an edge for Charlotte over some of the bigger markets where you're constantly being bombarded by fans, paparazzi, and also a hostile media environment. This is not a hostile media environment as displayed in that press conference. There were not a lot of tough questions about those negotiations or about P.J. Washington's you know, situation here in Charlotte. This is not a hostile media environment. It's a comfortable media environment. Some people like that, especially I think guys that were like superstars in college, like Kimba Walker. You know, I think he loved that about Charlotte. Uh, But some guys don't care about that. I don't think P.J. Washington cares about that, but he does care about long-term money. And he talked about that. He talked about securing the future for his family. And people, I think, underrate that as a factor for players signing longer term deals, especially when you're in the murky middle that PJ Washington finds himself in where he's not an all-star, he's not made the playoffs and there's not much of a market for him. Getting any long-term money is good for him and his family because if he had signed that qualifying offer Walker and broken a leg at that point, your career might be over because what's the market then when you come back from that? Yeah, that's the risk everybody makes in free agency. Like that's it, right. So, and PJ wanted that security, and he got it with 16 million incentives. You get the idea there. Three years, 48 million to be exact, with incentives. And PJ is in Charlotte. I'm glad that he wanted to be back in Charlotte. I think, yeah, you're right. You talk about it being a little bit of an advantage. At the end of the day, PJ Washington wants to come back on this specific deal. At least that's what he agreed to, and he doesn't want to be out of Charlotte so badly that he's willing to do anything to leave the city. That's what I care about. Well, well, he it, couldn't. Some- well, let's clarify. I don't know that he could have left. That's the problem, right? It was This was not a situation. Well, where he could have signed the qualifying w- offer and then left after a year. That's, well, he that's could, yes, he could, he could have done that, but he couldn't have done it this season, and there was big risk attached to signing that qualifying offer. If, he, if there was a market, this is what I'm saying, if there had been a market for P.J. Washington where multiple teams were extending him qualified, were extending him, offers that maybe the Hornets would have had to think twice about, you know, I I don't think that it would not have hurt PJ Washington's feelings had Charlotte not match. Again, the the location, the team structure, the players, I don't think any of that was a big enough pull for Washington. To me, this was all about securing some kind of long-term future for the, the, the family that he's built for himself. Yeah. Well, he got it with this three-year deal, and we'll see what happens at the end of it. There's a lot to get to. Hopefully, next season will work out for him as well. We still have more P.J. Washington comments to Don't get to. Don't go to sleep on the next. Hornets just yet. No, that was, me. That was me. I was a little, a little early on that. I podcast. apologize. No, you're, yes. I'm excited. No, you, you had some P.J. takes. You're firing them off. You're firing off the graphics. We are off and rolling on Locked On Hornets. We still have another P.J. Washington clip. We want to bring you on the other side of this thing. This episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs are pants that make you look good. They're khaki shorts they're designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg and it gives you a truly sculpted look just in case you need any help with it or you want to accentuate your already sculpted body 
Mm. Bird Dogs is just those shorts for you. Oh, Bird yeah. Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. And the Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. They use anti stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day. And they're functional for really any occasion. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA to enter promo code locked on NBA at checkout for a free bird dogs water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NBA for a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you more locked on Hornets coming up next is locked on Hornets. Walker, sometimes you don't have to have the best package. Okay. Sometimes you just have to have the only package. If you wait, or this is uh, if my dating life uh, taught me anything, sometimes you just have to wait around long enough until you're the only thing remaining. And then suddenly, you look pretty great in comparison. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. All right, let's go over some more comments here, Doug. I know you have another clip of what PJ might have been working on in the offseason. And I know we spoke to Kyle Bailey on WFNZ yesterday, WFNZ.com. You can go check that out on the Kyle Bailey pod tab. He discussed some things like what he thinks of Brandon Miller, said Brandon Miller's work ethic stands out to him. So that's mm. good news for the rookie. If you wanted sure. Brandon Miller's work ethic to be good, of course you do. And I didn't PJ hear that said, about – well, let's, let's just say – let's stop there and say – we shouldn't take that for granted because I think a lot of people hear that and go, yeah, it's just like something you say about a guy, you know, he's in, he's a gym rat. He's in the gym. You don't hear that about every single rookie. And, 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 you know, certain rookies didn't show up for summer league when maybe they should have shown up for summer league. And you didn't have people just going out of their way to mention work ethic for certain rookies that have gone through this program. So let's not take that for granted. Let's say, hey, props to Brandon Miller, number two overall pick. He's ready to work. Nope, PJ is excited about Brandon Miller and what is to come for his rookie season. And he's also excited for what's to come for his season individually, saying he's been working hard on a lot of different fronts. But he also gave you one specific skill set he's been working on this offseason. Okay, that is not the clip that I have. We can talk. I would love to talk about that, but I don't have that clip. The, the clip that I have is gotcha. about Mitch Kupchak revealing a little bit more about the negotiations because they, we, knew, we knew, or at least we assumed, they were difficult because it took a long time, an unprecedented amount of time for any kind of negotiation that the Hornets have really had in an offseason, especially when it revolves around a rookie and a restricted free agency. So we got a little bit more on that. So I'll, you know, I'll give you the choice. Do you want to hear that clip or do you want to talk about PJ Washington's game? <laughs> Your call. Well, let's let's talk about the mid-range and then go to the clip because okay. I he he said he's been working on his mid-range this summer. Mm -hmm. And with that, I know you had some stats on that. One stat that I found here, Doug, that I found interesting. I was just looking up his numbers as a role man. And he actually finished in the 77th percentile in efficiency okay. as the role man in the NBA last year. Good. And if you're talking about accounting for volume too, PJ was the role man in a lot of different possessions this year. So you're talking about 77th percentile. Like for instance, Gordon Hayward actually finishes one spot above him, according to NBA.com. But the possessions are significantly less. You're talking about 1.7% uh, for PJ Washington, you're talking about just a half a possession for uh, Gordon Hayward. So if you're going with percentile and any kind of volume, legitimate and actually significant volume, then PJ Washington was one of the better role men in all of the NBA last season in terms of efficiency and the amount of times that he was that guy. So especially coming out of the short roll, you like PJ's decision making when the ball hits his hands at that free throw line, anything like that. And so if you're a little more comfortable shooting that shot, then I love that PJ, like you might think about this and go, oh, it's not the way of the NBA this anymore. It's not, you know, it's an old man's game. No, PJ Washington as the short roll guy could you know be really lethal with decision making and knocking down a lot more of those mid range jumpers, especially working with Lamelo, which is part of the reason why I wanted PJ Washington on this team so bad. The efficiency as the roll guy with a great pick and roll ball handler and Lamelo, yeah, it makes sense to bring him back, and I'm glad they came to terms on a deal. 
77th percentile on role possessions. And a lot of that, I'm going to assume, because LaMelo Ball didn't play a lot of games last season, a lot of that efficiency coming without the help of an elite point guard distributing to you. So that's Mm -hmm. a little context there that says, hey, that number might even be a little bit more impressive. And he certainly, I think, uh, going to the rim a little bit more, maybe not as efficiently as you'd like him to finish at the rim. He was... Uh, let's see, what was his efficiency at the rim? I know, let's see, frequency was at 27%, so not going there a ton. Efficiency was 35th percentile at the rim, according to cleaning the glass. But back to the mid-range, he definitely increased the amount of mid-range takes that that he that he attempted last season. And his usage overall went up because he went back to being a starter. Two years ago, he was on the bench. And he was getting about 14% usage. That went up to about 19% when he was a starter last season. A little higher than when he was a starter his first two seasons because there were a lot of injuries and a lot of the offense was running through P.J. Washington. But his mid-range game went up to 32% of his possessions. And that's a career high. Even in those first two seasons where he started, it was at 22% and 21%. So he was taking a ton of mid-range shots relative to the rest of his career. That's 76 percentile, by the way, for bigs across the league, so way above average. But a lot of those, Walker, were coming in the short mid, not necessarily in the long mid, not in those mid-range shots that everybody hates. Um, We're talking about short mid. We're talking about, you saw this a lot last season, we made a note of it, these little short push shots from the foul line, you know, just, just getting it up on the rim. That's something he unleashed last season. The problem is, and I think P.J. Washington recognizes this, that it wasn't as efficient for him as it could have been. On those short mid shots, his accuracy was 44%. That's slightly below average. On long mid-range shots, it was 32%. That's well below average. On all mid-range shots, it was 41%. That's well below average. Here's the problem. For your overall efficiency, if you're taking a lot of mid-range shots, two-pointers, and you're not making a lot of them, Right. That's going to drag your efficiency. There's a reason why players like James Harden shoot at the rim and and from three. Because even if they miss it more, their, their efficiency is going to be overall accelerated. So, look, he's making a big bet here on his mid-range game. It's got to improve. Otherwise, he's going to drag down the offense. I mean, I would actually I – would, I get why he's doing this. Because I think he wants to be – a Gordon Hayward replacement. He wants to be an all-around tool that that teams desire these days. They want on their team. I mean, but I think for this season and the, and the next couple that the Hornets have him, I think it would actually benefit the team more if he just focused on becoming a better three-point shooter, a more effective three-point shooter, and, and better at the rim. Well, a couple of things for me. One, I'm sure that it's not coming at the sacrifice of the latter. I would hope I'm deciding not to shoot on shoot three pointers this offseason only mid. I would imagine he's working on three pointers pretty well, too. And hopefully it gets back to what it was the previous season on lower volume. The other thing is, I actually don't think I mean, I, I, I do think it's good because with with PJ continuing that role, right? If we expect him to be a role guy especially with LaMelo ball, having the basketball in his hands, then that means there are still going to be those opportunities. And you're totally right about him missing those shots and that hurting the offense, no doubt about it. But if the volume doesn't increase or decrease, if it's similar, which I expect it to be depending on how much his usage is, but you get the idea, you know, it's not like we're giving him this basketball and saying, Hey, go get a bucket. That's not going to be this year. PJ, as long as everybody stays healthy. So if he finds himself more in that same area of the floor again, and he's been working on hitting a lot more of those shots, and then you get to an average or above average level, then that's a good thing for the Charlotte Hornets. Like, I I don't think with Gordon Hayward, we just talked about, you know, he's got 1.2 possessions less per game as the role guy. So even as a replacement for Gordon, I think that's your type B role if Gordon Hayward is gone. But PJ's real role, like what you want to ask him to do the most, that's going to be different from your half-court bailout guy in Gordon Hayward. Yeah, I, I think on the the role possessions, like if he were to become a better mid-range player, and again, when I'm talking about the mid-range, well, that's I'm not what he's talking, working on, right? Right. So if he were to become a better mid-range player, <laughs> then that's going Ooh, to put spicy. <laughs> well, 
I that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. I and I don't do it. <laughs> I don't do it to you very often. So no, you know, you don't. that's <laughs> that was, so. If he were yes. if he were to become a better, I don't even have coffee to sip on. That's my problem. I'm, I don't have enough coffee. I don't have any coffee to sip on. So when I make this great point that I'm about to make, I've got mm-hmm. nothing to uh, show the audience how great of a point it was. If he were to become a better mid range player. In the short mid-range, it, with those push shots that he's making, not not long mid-range shots, but those short shots, if he were to do that, it's going to put tremendous pressure on an opposing defense. It's going to allow him to get more space on those pick-and-pop possessions that he's made a lot of money on. And it's going to help, uh, really, the entire team might open up more shots for Brandon Miller, who he probably, I'm glad he's talking about Brandon Miller's work ethic, because you might see those two players playing alongside each other in a lot of possessions next season if they're both coming off the bench. So so I think it's going to benefit the team tremendously if he can. But what I'm saying is it's a big bet because if it doesn't, then I think everyone's going to be disappointed. Sure. It would be disappointing if you didn't get better. No doubt about that. All right, you want to go to the next clip with P.J. Washington and the negotiations with Mitch Kupchak because this thing took a long time. Took maybe, forever maybe, and a day. maybe, maybe in the next segment. We can go to that in the next segment as well. Coming up next on the yeah! Lockdown Hornets podcast, the schedule. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We're going to get the scheduling figured out on this podcast. All right, coming up next, then we will have the Mitch Kupchak clip for you. He talks about the negotiations going well into the offseason between both he and PJ. That's coming up on Lockdown Hornets. All right, now, finally, now, I've been asking for the clip forever. Uh, two times, I've, I've had the scheduling wrong. I think we're going to play the clip People want now. it. They want it. They're salivating for it. They're shaking. They're saying, give us this Mitch Kupchak sound now. All right, here's Mitch Kupchak talking about the negotiations. Without going into great detail, right, being restricted free agent, you know, there's restrictions that come along with, you know, that kind of status. And quite frankly, just sometimes things take longer sometimes than they do other times. Um, But there was always, you know, a good intent, you know, from, you know, the negotiation. You know, nobody ever, you know, kind of went sideways. Everybody was very professional. They understood. We listened to each other. You know, took a couple of weeks off, got back on the phone. Uh, Sometimes it just, it just takes longer. Um, but I think the key is, you know, on the um, representation side, um, they always were level-headed and listened and were always engaged. And, and I hope that, that we did the same thing. And when those things happen, then most times there's going to be a deal. <laughs> what did we learn, Walker? What did we learn that? When things some, are yeah. restricted, that means they're restricted. Uh, and some things that take longer than others take longer than others. Any That's questions? The, any further I questions? I think the, la- the last part was really <laughs> home run hitting, was sometimes things take longer than others. And uh, this one was one of those things. In, yeah. In, well, in, I, in, all, in all seriousness, I, I find this interesting because we don't uh, – even though he started by saying, I don't want to go into great detail, I think he did give us – a few details that we don't typically get. I think in in terms of negotiations, nobody wants to talk about these things unless they are slipping a, a, you know, DM to Adrian Wojnarowski so they can get their name in a tweet. Like agents don't want to talk about this process. Players really don't want to talk about this process. They pretend like, (laughs) I love this. I love the players like pretending I don't, I'm not involved. I'm just in the gym. Nobody talks to me. It's all my people. They're dealing with that stuff. I don't care about the money. Like get out of here. This is your future. This is your dollar amount. This is money that you're going to use for your family and your and your personal well-being. Like, don't tell me that you're not involved at all. I don't believe that. I'm calling cap on that, like Mitch called cap on PJ. So, but but you know, nobody wants to talk about this, but but Mitch did, and, and he's saying a couple of things here that nobody in this negotiation got squirrely. No one said, All right, we're walking away from the table. We don't want to talk anymore. This is over. Like everyone's, you know, even though they took a couple of weeks off, I think that's interesting because. I don't know that I would assume this, but I think there could be some people that would assume that when you have a negotiation that goes this long, 
the people are just on the phone every day, like, hey, we're, you know, let's get back to it. Or, you know, but th- th- there are these long breaks where we say, all right, we're going to take a couple weeks off. And when we get back from vacation or scouting or whatever we're doing, then we'll come back and we'll figure this thing out. So th- those are a couple of cool insights into this process. No, it, it was. And um, we talked about this second soft deadline that teams usually come to terms with when we're talking about trades that happen right before the season. When we're talking about, you know, I'd use the Laurie Markinen example where you have the trade. First off, you have the signing and the trade going to the Bulls from or from to the Cavaliers, excuse me, from the Bulls. And then you have the Donovan Mitchell trade involving the Cavs as well. And so mm-hmm. that happened right at September 1st, late August, like September 26th. And that week, that is another like deadline you can pay attention to for the longer deals and even christian wood right like these are you know christian wood just agreed with uh, to a uh, a deal with the lakers i believe yesterday that news came in and and so now that happened on september 5th so this is the time i i heard bobby marks on a podcast yesterday talking about how players are looking up and oh wait we got a report in three weeks like season's almost here so right. this is what's going on and uh it, it greases the wheels on a deal to be made um in a lot of different scenarios you want to go to list or do you want to do this tomorrow or what, what are you thinking with the list i'm i'm excited to hear your okay. i don't have i don't have any of my list ready yet but i i'm excited to hear your list i just want to i want to give this space to you and 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 give this space to me to criticize your list go ahead oh, no i like it so <laughs> l- let's do it all right so so we the categories top 35 hornets of all time hornets scoring it scorn it the power hour haphazard hornets best of the rest mm-hmm. doug gets mad at me yep. others get mad at me others get mad at me is where we left off and that was the one player call this section i'm going to go with the top three here in this category only three players and you know how you have the cheerleader section i believe that are called what are they called i think they're the top cats with the carolina panthers that's I correct think that's right okay mm-hmm. so, honeybees for the hornets top cats that's for right. the panthers All right, so I have this three-person category known as the Top Cats, okay? You can probably guess a couple of players that will be in this category. All right, so coming in at number 10, just sneaking in there, the great big Al, Al Jefferson. Wow, still, he's hanging on. I don't know if he's going to be here when we do this for the 40th anniversary, but big Al hanging in at the Top 10. He will not be. He will not be in there. Lamella Ball (laughs) continuing to ascend, but he's there in the top 10. That was a tough one. Lamella, Al Jefferson. Problem is, Al Jefferson got an all-NBA appearance. That's it. That's that's the line. That's the line. That's all Lamella has to do. Lamella does the bar is not and that, you know i think that's a great thing about lamello signing a max contract here it's like lamello the bar is not high you sign a contract in la you sign a contract in chicago that bar <laughs> suddenly goes to the friggin moon but in yeah. charlotte <laughs> you know it's a monkey bar like it's very very low <laughs> so so al jefferson comes in at number 10 i did struggle with lamello and al a little bit but that one year was special and he gave us two really good years before moving on um before it got old and then goes to indiana you get the idea all right number nine on the top cats category anthony mason Mm. r.i.p anthony mason comes in and also in 96 and 97 gives you an all nba appearance leads the league in minutes that year for the Charlotte Hornets as well, that he gets an all NBA appearance, those fantastic teams. Glenn Rice was on that squad as well. So also point forward with a bowling ball of a body, you know, fun player. Anthony Mason was very good facilitator, like weird kind of ahead of his time, but also just, just a weird player all around, but to lead the league in minutes and be that good. I thought that was special enough to get number nine. Uh, totally 90s bad boy i think you know was the sort mm-hmm. of quintessential off the court ew, on the court yes mm-hmm. and he was the hornets triple double leader until lamello came along he was lamello before lamello and anthony mason was uh, made made the hornets fun to watch and and help them you know they 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 let zo go and you go uh oh and then they let lj go and you go, oh, but Anthony Mason and Glenn Rice, who came in with uh, on the Zoe trade, you know, all that 
kind of came together to extend winning for those uh, original Hornets runs. So props to Anthony Mason. I should clarify and say it's minutes per game for Mason, but he also played 73 games that year. And not only did he get an all NBA uh, uh, appearance, but he also had an all defensive that year. So all NBA and all defense, it's actually a crazy season. For He's like a the, uh, isn't he like the ultimate old head Hornet fan person? Like People he love played, him. played a ton really of games, Iron Man, tough, mm-hmm. you know, wasn't afraid to put your bleep in the dirt, you know. Right. So, well, what's interesting, and and it'll help us get to number eight here, is I think people compare Anthony Mason to, well, let's get to it. All right, I'll, I'll do this. Let's go to number eight. So, coming up, number eight, to finish out the Top Cats category, it's the other Bobcat. It's Crash. It's Gerald Wallace. Wow! Coming in at number eight. Yeah, you've, you've upset a lot of Bobcats fans. So this this is this is what happened last time. Too low. Right. This is what people said until they heard the other names. No, you're right. Like this <laughs> right? is right. It's the problem people, with lists. It's always the problem like, with lists. I can't right. tell you the other seven names, but you gotta just trust me here that when you hear the other seven names, this is all gonna make sense. Right. So I remember I think it was uh I think it was Billy Marshall. Shout out to Billy Marshall. You probably know him from Carolina Panthers Twitter. Fantastic talent evaluator in the NFL world, Panthers. Uh, I remember him tweeting one time that he almost crashed his car when he heard Gerald Wallace was at number eight because it was too late. I just remember that tweet. But the guys in front of him, I I stand by this and actually feel very confident despite loving what Gerald Wallace did for this team. He was actually a top 10 Hornet. Remember when the Hornets celebrated the top 10 players in franchise history Mm -hmm. for the top for the 30th Mm -hmm. anniversary. And we didn't know if they were going to include a Bobcat. They did. It was Gerald Wallace, and that was fantastic. I think they actually had Kendall Gill in that top 10, too. Since then, I put LaMelo in there, and I thought Al Jefferson, actually. I I put him in there. But regardless, I saw a tweet circulating about Gerald Wallace having a season that was the best season in Bobcats, Charlotte history. You go to that 2009-2010 year. He was an all-star, the only all-star in Bobcats history. So Al Jefferson, while getting an all-NBA appearance, Never had an all-star appearance. Gerald Wallace, the only all-star in franchise history. So 18 points per game that year, shot 37% from three. You're also talking about him having a steal and a half per game and over a block per game. In 2005 and 2006, he's one of like four players ever to have over two steals and over two blocks in a season, which is amazing. So... Uh, Gerald Wallace or so Gerald Wallace just being the guy that you showed up for as a Bobcat fan on that playoff team. I've got Gerald Wallace in number eight, and it's why so many people have him higher. But once you hear the list, everybody, I think everybody would agree. Like, I feel pretty comfortable. Nobody would have Gerald Wallace higher once you hear the other names. And that's fine. He, you know, he's endearing because of what you just said. He made that suffering a little bit more tolerable. He made the, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're, when you, when you've got the sickness, when you had the sickness back then with the Bobcats and and you had the, the, the cold sweats and you had the fever and the chills because the sickness was really bad. You know, he was a a cold uh, washcloth on your forehead in that time. And he did make the team worth watching. He was fun because defensively he was all over the floor and then, you know, high flying dunks, just super athletic, MKG, except he didn't get hurt all the time. Crash uh, was amazing and loved to watch him play. But if if Crash were, you know, in this, I think, era where there are some exciting young players to talk about all the time, there weren't exciting young players back then. It was Crash and, and that was it. You know, maybe, maybe we wouldn't rate him so highly, but he did get that all-star appearance. And you mentioned the uh, Al Jefferson All-NBA. We should know, like, that All-NBA – it was a perfect all NBA uh, bid for Al Jefferson because it came at a time when all NBA was still giving it out to centers. And Al Jefferson was one of the few centers in the league getting the kind of touches and usage. It was, I mean, talking about sort of peak transition of the center position going from, we're going to throw this guy the ball a lot to, you know, we're asking him to do something defensively, but offensively, unless he can shoot, we're not really interested in it. Uh, But Al Jefferson came along at a perfect time to snag that All-NBA. So if LaMelo at the point guard position gets a third, even a third team All-NBA, 
He yeah. doesn't need two All NBAs to beat Al Jefferson's one All NBA because that was kind of a sneak All NBA. If he gets third team All NBA, if Lamelo gets third team All NBA at the point guard position, that's that's it. It's you know he's he's ascending. Well, and point. and just to be fair, to move up to top ten, like Doug, if Lamelo gets an All Star appearance this year, Lamelo moves up. <laughs> that's it. It's just a, put but, him you up know, there. two All Star appearances real quickly. That that two thousand five two thousand six season where he had over two blocks and two steals a game. Um, three players ever ever have accomplished that in a season. Hakeem Olajuwon did it four wow. times. Sure. Okay. The dream. David Robinson did it once. And then the Gerald Admiral, Wallace did it. The Admiral. That's I don't know the what list. happened there. Sorry. Dream, Admiral, Crash. You had to have a sick one, one word nickname. And both of the, well, I guess the Admiral, you get the idea. We'll find out. Those we'll two. find out where Crash ends up on my list. I'll just go ahead and spoil it. It's on there. We'll just find out where, where it lands. It's fantastic. All right, that'll do it for Locked On Hornets. That'll do it for the Top Cats category. Top seven on my list. We also will get to the nicknames list for one Doug Branson. Also, go make sure you check out his work on his sub stack, everyhornetsboxscore.com, and text him. Text him on his subtext by subscribing to subtext. How can they find that information, Doug? Join subtext.com forward slash Locked On Hornets. Link right, in the show notes. <laughs> Thanks for making us your first listen. Make your second listen game to game NBA every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked on game to game covers every game from across the league with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow game to game on Locked On NBA, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. 